Mr. President, now we're going to hear a lot this summer about precedents. The traditional question on these matters has been, will the nominee defer to precedent? Nominees will be asked if they respect settled law. This is known as the principle of stare decisis. The nominee always answers that yes, he or she will respect and defer to precedent. And senators nod their heads, having received this rickety, vague assurance that the nominee will not rock the judicial boat and turn the clock back decades. But for two reasons. This standard, settled law, stare decisis, is no longer an adequate standard by which to judge nominees. Why? Well, first, we have ample example from the past several years of judges who have sworn in their confirmation hearings to respect precedent and then reverse their stand once on the court. For example, in his confirmation hearings, then Judge Gorsuch said that, quote, precedent is like our shared family history of judges. It deserves our respect, unquote. Last week, just last week, now Justice Gorsuch voted to overturn 41 years of precedent in the Janus decision, relying on flimsy and fabricated legal theory. It was so flimsy, in fact, that Judge Kagan wrote in dissent that the majority overruled precedent, quote, for not exceptional or special reason, but because it never liked the decision, subverting all known principles of stare decisis. Justice Roberts, another person who swore he would obey precedent, he said he'd call balls and strikes as he saw them, rather than interpret law. Rather, sorry. Justice Roberts said he would call balls and strikes as he saw them, that he would interpret law rather than make it. Of course, it was Justice Roberts who was then responsible for overturning 40 years of precedent in the Citizens United decision that so set back our politics, that so deepened the swamp that so many Americans despise by allowing huge amounts of dark money, unreported, to cascade into our political system on two of the most important rulings in the history of the Roberts Court, a cumulative 81 years of precedent were thrown out the window, despite the earnest promises of Justices Roberts and Gorsuch at their hearings. So when they say they'll obey settled law, you can't believe it. You can't believe it, because it just hasn't happened in this new conservative court that is so eager to make law, not interpret it. And there's a second reason, maybe even more important, why the principle of, quote, I'll follow settled law no longer works. And that's President Trump. We already know that President Trump's nominee will be prepared to overturn the precedents of Roe v. Wade and NFIB versus Sebelius. We know that because President Trump has said so. When the president has a litmus test for his nominees and only chooses from a pre-approved list of nominees designed to satisfy that litmus test, it is certainly not enough for a judge to prove his or her moderation by invoking stare decisis. Stare decisis and respect for precedent have become an almost meaningless bar to set for a Supreme Court nominee. At this critical juncture, with so many rights and liberties at stake, U.S. Senators and the American people should expect an affirmative statement of support for the personal liberties of all Americans from the next Supreme Court nominee. The American people deserve to know what kind of a justice President Trump's nominee would be. President Trump is the one who made the litmus test for his nominee, not us. The onus is on his nominee to show where he or she might stand. 
considering the ample evidence that President Trump will only select a nominee who will undermine protection for Americans with pre-existing conditions, give greater weight to corporate interests than the interests of our citizens, no matter what precedent says, and vote to overturn Roe v. Wade, the next nominee has an obligation, a serious and solemn obligation, to share their personal views on these legal issues, no matter whom President Trump selects tonight. Now briefly on another matter, the ongoing negotiations with North Korea over their nuclear program. Despite all the reality show pomp and circumstance, the negotiations have thus far been a flop. After the summit, President Trump declared without any evidence, that's so typical, that, quote, North Korea is no longer a nuclear threat, unquote, his words, to the United States. The reality, of course, is far, far different. Recent reports have shown that North Korea is making upgrades to a nuclear facility and expanding ballistic missile manufacturing. Just a few days ago, North Korean media called the negotiations with Secretary of State Pompeo, quote, deeply regrettable, unquote, accusing the Trump administration of pushing, quote, a unilateral and gangster-like demand for denuclearization. Talks going great, and then our side is, 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 is accused of being gangster-like? For the president to say that North Korea is no longer a nuclear threat and then have North Korea's foreign ministry come back and say what they said shows the disconnect between President Trump's rhetoric and the reality and the sheer incompetence of this administration. For those who say, and I hear it all the time, from many of my Republican friends in my state and throughout the country. They say, look, we don't like the president's style. We wish he didn't tweet so much. But we support him because he's, quote, getting stuff done. Take a look at the yawning gap between what the president claims and what he's actually achieved. On North Korea and on so many other issues, like taxes, like health care, for two other examples, the president makes grand promises, but fails to deliver for the American people. And finally, Mr. President, one word on health care. Another issue that the president has failed to deliver on is health care. After promising far better and cheaper health care for all Americans, President Trump has relentlessly sabotaged our health care system, undermined key protections for Americans with pre-existing conditions, done all he can to see that premiums rise, Probably the number one issue bothering America today, rising health care costs. Last week, the Trump administration found another way to sabotage our existing health care system, suspending a critical program that stabilizes the health care insurance markets. This comes at a time when 2019 premiums are being filed, and insurers from coast to coast are saying that the Republican sabotage is causing premiums to increase to be much higher than they need to be. Many of these insurers are also saying that if the Trump administration enacts further sabotage, such as actions like this one and the expansion of junk plans that hurt people with pre-existing conditions, then insurers may need to amend their rates and raise premiums even more. This relentless health care sabotage is politically motivated, spiteful, and accomplishes nothing except to raise costs on middle-class families and taxpayers. The Trump administration needs to fix this newest sabotage as quickly as possible. I yield the floor.